Welcome to ANN in Depth. Today we are talking with Karen Glassford, the Digital Evangelism Manager for the Seventh day Adventist World Church. Karen, welcome to ANN in Depth. Thank you. Good to be here with you, Sam. So, you've been working in digital evangelism for the last 25 years almost. But more recently, you moved from AWR to the communications department to focus on a very specific thing called online pastoral care and helping our local churches as well as the world church to understand what that means. Uh, before we dive deeper into what it means today, tell me about the chat rooms of the 90s, which is a recipe for disaster because most of them were about sex at that time. But anyway, <laughs> yours wasn't. What, what was that no, about? I hope not. No, well, during the Net 98 meetings, the, we decided to go digital. And the most... Uh, innovative thing was, you know, the fact that you could watch the evangelistic series via satellite around the world. But then we added in chat rooms where people could come in for several hours every night around the globe so that it would be in the right time zone after the meetings had been watched to ask Bible questions. And and uh, we had pastors and they're staffing it. Um, I was approving every single comment as it came through so that it wouldn't just scroll off the screen 90 miles an hour, but we would have five, six hours a day of English with usually 80 to 250 people in there at a given time. They thought they were anonymous and to everybody else they were, to us not quite as much, the behind the scenes, but they would ask their questions about that night's presentation and because they were anonymous, they felt safe. You said we, who's we? We were working with an organization <laughs> with the Oregon Conference called Joy River back in those days. And uh, in an effort to also find people who could do online Bible studies. So I had a Voice of Prophecy school that was announced in the chat room at all times. And so there for a while, I had several hundred students. How did people find out about the chat room? Every single night during the meetings, the co-hosts would announce that you could go on at the end of the meeting and ask any questions that you wanted. And people came. And people came by the hordes. And we were running not just in English, but in like six other languages as well. But I monitored the English ones. That's amazing. Whose idea was it? There was a team of us that worked together. Um, I had heard about chat rooms and started trying to find the few that were on there and yeah, they were not too respectable. I found one, I think, that had something to do with mechanics or something, and I was just looking as to how people interacted. And so I talked to our programmer, and I said, look, some of the features that I would love to have the ability to do is I would love to be able to whisper to a person so that only they would see the communication that I had to do for them. So, like, if somebody posted something that was rude or obnoxious or anything else, I could whisper to them and I'd say, hey, try that again, but be a little less direct or be a little kinder in the way you say it. So we were able to coach people and and keep them quiet when they were rude. <laughs> so it was great. Well, that was 98, you said, right? Yeah, net 98. That's a long time ago. Yeah, and then we did Acts 2000, net 2003. 24 years ago? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. But people came by, by by the hordes, and it was really, really cool because, oh, probably maybe 15, 20 years later, I was at a general conference session, and I am waiting for lunch, and I'm sitting on this very long bench, and there's a gentleman sitting at the other end of the bench. So I just struck up a conversation. I said, oh, are you one of the delegates? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just a, I'm just a lay person. I'm just here because I want to be here. And I said, oh. So have you been an Adventist your whole life? And he said, hardly. And I said, oh, so how did you become an Adventist? And he says, well, you know, there was these big net meetings. There was this thing called Net 98. And uh, he said, I would have never darkened the door of a church. He says, I got the advertisement. He said, I found that I could watch it off of my satellite. And so he said, I started watching it there. And uh, then he said, I saw there was this chat room thing you could go no to. No way. And he says, I went every night and I asked questions. And I just looked at him and I said, what was your screen name when you were in there? And he told me, and I happened to remember his screen name because oh, it was very goodness. unique. And I said, wow, yeah, you did come every night. And he said, what? And he tried to look at my name badge, so I turned it around and he goes, oh, 
are you the Karen from the chat room? And I said, yeah. And he said, no way. And I, it was just the coolest thing ever. He said, yeah, I was safe because I could ask questions. Nobody knew who I was. And he says, and I ask questions every night. And eventually towards the end of the meetings, I went and found the local site and I got baptized. I think that was God's gift to you. Oh, absolutely. God absolutely. didn't need to, sh to share with you the, the results of that initiative, but he, he did. And, and there's and probably others that we'll never know till we get to heaven, you know, but it was really wow. cool to meet somebody. That was a glimpse of the of yes. heaven right there. Yes. So right now, we are very concerned as a church with the effects of digital communication to our operation mm -hmm. in every way. We are discussing what it means to be an online church. Mm-hmm. Uh, what it means to be a hybrid church. What it, We don't even understand the nomenclature properly. So this is uh, a concern that most administrators have. COVID and the pandemic has accelerated that process exponentially. We only existed in many parts of the world because of digital communication. Right, right. And one of those aspects is pastoral care. Local church pastors, they have provided pastoral care for, mil for millennia since the, the early church. And in the Adventist church in particular, we have pastors in, in all of our churches pretty much, and they offer pastoral care. The elders are invited to offer pastoral care. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me about pastoral care. What is it that is has been done face-to-face and then we move to the digital, the online part of that. Well, traditionally, pastoral care involves the elder or the pastor or the intern, you know, knocking on somebody's door that maybe came to an evangelistic series and you wonder why they've been missing a few nights or knocking on somebody's door because they're a church member that you need to go visit that you have not seen in a while or that you know is going through a rough time and you know, it's a matter of sitting down and having a conversation, listening, sometimes involving Bible studies, uh, sometimes answering questions, sometimes doing some counseling, pastoral counseling with with the person that they're visiting. So that has been, you know, traditionally done in person, occasionally over the phone, but traditionally in person. And, you know, there are some real benefits to doing it in person because there is something very personable about having the pastor come to your house. It's also stressful <laughs> for the person that's receiving the pastor unless they know for sure when the pastor's coming over because maybe, you know, it's a mom with three young kids and the house is torn up <laughs> and they want the pastor to see their house looking nice. Or, you know, maybe there is a member of the family who doesn't want anything to do with God and they are disgusted that the pastor has come over and perhaps do not conduct themselves in the best way and it's awkward or embarrassing or whatever. And um, so there are challenges, but to face to face online, of course, there's challenges as well. But I think one of the great advantages to online is that it can happen anytime. So it doesn't have to be at necessarily an appropriate hour. You don't have to worry about avoiding meal times because people's meal times are all over the board, depending on their job. Right. Um, it, it, they don't have to worry about whether their house looks good or not. You know, if somebody in the family isn't approving of them having this pastoral visit, it's not a big deal because you can just be in your room with your with your AirPods on and your Mac and yeah, or PC if you're that yes, way inclined. Yes, or PC. <laughs> when I when I was asked many years ago about online pastoral care, I didn't think people would trust mm -hmm. online as much as they would face to face. Mm -hmm they wouldn't share as much. Mm. They wouldn't open up as much. Mm. And as a local church pastor, if people don't open up, there's no pastoral care. If right. they're not willing to be vulnerable, there's nothing that I can do. Right, right, right. So there are some things that I noticed. It took like three, four years in a congregation before people mm -hmm. started sharing, you know, the, the really deep stuff. Um, but we found online that people are more willing to self-disclose over text messages than they are over face-to-face. So, -face. True. So, so true. For the last few years, I've been pursuing a PhD and I've been researching on this topic. 
And I've uncovered that that is, in fact, true. People mm -hmm. self-disclose more on text message than mm -hmm. they do face-to-face. Uh, -face. Why do you think that is? You know, I have been asking myself that question for a long time, especially when you see political fights and everything else happening on social media. You know, why do people think that they can be so open with their opinions and so opinionated, you know? It's like, we know who you are. It's not like you're anonymous, you know? I can go to your profile and find out all kinds of stuff about you. I'm not sure, but it is absolutely true. The phenomena is, is that people are almost instantly more open within, you know, even the first conversation, but certainly within a conversation or two. People are much more open and much more willing to share. I think that it's maybe that it's less intimidating because they can't see your face. Unless, of course, you're doing it by Zoom or something. But if it's a text message, they can't see your face. You can't see their face. So they can text you. They could be bawling their eyes out, and you're not privy to that. I am I'm discovering the word shame being uh, coming up again and again when I ask pastors about their experience as to why people are more willing to open on on text than in person. And this seems to be one of the reasons that they can control exactly what they say before they mm -hmm. hit send. Mm -hmm. And they are not, they don't have to be aware of how the other person is reacting at the moment they share it. Right. So if I share something about my life now, you are looking at me and you will react in a certain way that will either increase or decrease right. our connection based on on what I just shared, if it is sensitive information, personal, and, and so on. So there was even this, this, uh, this pastor who was talking to a member about, in Europe somewhere, about the recent divorce. Mm -hmm. And it's something that pastors are there for. In fact, pastors are usually there for the most important moments in people's lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such a privilege to be, to be welcomed in people's lives at their greatest moments of joy, need, pain, all of it. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not boring being a pastor. If, <laughs> if somebody is bored being a pastor, they're not doing it right. Right, right. Um, so this guy that was going through this divorce, he was on Zoom and the pastor was visiting him on Zoom. It was during COVID. And the guy asked that they go to chat because he was too embarrassed of what he had to share. Mm -hmm. But text seemed to be a, a better medium mm -hmm. because he was not as self-aware. There, there were no eyes looking at him. Mm -hmm. So the data, and there is one research that uncovers this, uh, that measured this, face-to-face -face people share the least. Mm -hmm. Over video-mediated communication, they share a little bit more. Over phone calls, they share a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And over text, they share the most. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think we will adapt our pastors? We have tens of thousands of pastors. I don't know the number exactly. Perhaps somebody could find out how many Adventist pastors there are and let me know. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to find out how many Adventist pastors there are. We know we have 162,000 congregations, and the average is 11 congregations per pastor. I think it will be about 16 to 20,000 pastors. That's my guess. Let's mm -hmm. see what happens. Um, maybe more. I don't know. We'll see. But how do you think they will fare in this new world where they need to visit digitally? where it is expected that they would be available for these interactions. Even if you don't call it a pastoral visit, that is what it is. You know, mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. go through the same. How do you think pastors will fare in this new world? I think that pastors need to be more connected, some of them, especially some of the older generation that did not grow up with social media, did not grow up with texting and all that kind of stuff, are going to have to adapt a little bit. And, you know, and learn that texting actually can be a very effective way. Um, there are advantages to doing it as to the pastor as well, such as 
you have time, you can pause and gather your thoughts before you send the next message, right? You can pause. And it's not as awkward as being face-to-face and thinking about what you want to, to say. You know, you're wanting a resource. You can get up and grab the resource off the shelf, you know, and, and look up something that you wanted to share with them, you know, like, well, you know, the Bible says this, you know, and one of the authors said this, maybe this is something you should consider. But I think that pastors uh, will fare very well if they decide to engage with their church members as much as possible not just face to face obviously there is still a need to gather together on sabbath as much as possible and worship face to face because that is a that is a huge benefit if we can but there's all kinds of people that we've seen during the pandemic that because of illness because of remoteness from church for whatever reason they have continued to worship online and it has opened up church back to them again that they never had before i mean church and them were disconnected it was it was strictly a spectator sport of watching perhaps the hope channel or something and watching a church service that's being broadcast but now they can see their friends it's their church it's those kids that they used to mentor or they that now have kids of their own or whatever that they can watch and if the pastor can connect with these people uh digitally um I think the future is very bright because it gives many more points of contact than a pastor could ever do face to face. You can only be in so many places at once, but you can easily be carrying on three text conversations at the same time if need be. Let's dive deeper into this. There are many pastors that listen to this podcast. How let's discuss how to conduct a digital visitation. What Mm -hmm. does that look like? Well, for every pastor and every age group, it may be a little different. You know, like if if it's a young adult, just saying, hey, yo, how you doing? Yo, you know? <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> in whatever vernacular and language you speak, you know, um, you know, how's life treating you? How was your last test you were telling me that you were stressed out about in school? You know, um, how are you handling being a new mom? You know, how is your mom doing now that she's come out of surgery? So the topics and the way you approach things are endless depending on the on the conversation. But it's just a willingness to be invested in your church members lives, to be invested in those that visit your church, that they know the pastor has noticed what's going on in their life and is actually, you know, because maybe a kid tells you, One of your teenagers at your church tells you on a Sabbath morning, hey, pastor, I'm super stressed. I have this real big test on Monday. Can you pray for me? Well, you don't see them again until the next Sabbath if you're lucky. And maybe they went to a different church that Sabbath. You may not see them for two weeks. And by then, you've forgotten. You know, but if Monday afternoon you can text them and say, hey, how did your test go? They're like, what? Really? The pastor cares that much? He he remembers me? It opens the door for all kinds of mentorship okay. and, so and the answering pastor, questions. The pastor connects, uh, initiates conversation by picking up on what happened before, perhaps just asking for how can I best pray for you yes. and that sort yes. of thing. And then the, the person responds and they have a conversation. How, how long is is still appropriate for a pastor to take the time to respond to the person when they initiate the conversation. So let me clarify the question. If I'm the pastor and we have Susie here, one of my members, and I contact Susie asking, hey, Susie, I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm about to pray for you today. I want to know how best to pray for you. Last time I prayed for this, uh-huh. Um, and God answered the prayer or didn't, mm-hmm. you know, it was mm-hmm. still waiting. Mm-hmm. Uh, how can I best pray for you today? And then within five minutes, Susie answers. How long is it appropriate for me to respond to Susie? Can I wait a few hours? Does it have to be immediate? Tell me about the impact of time, do you think? Obviously, that? some answer is better than no answer. So if you at the moment are so busy in a crisis of your own that you can't answer immediately, that's okay. But the sooner you can answer, the better. By far. Why? Because it means that you're invested, that you're available, that you didn't just text her as out of duty and you walked away and did your own thing. It means I care about you enough that I texted you and I waited. 
and you responded, and I care enough to acknowledge that response and say, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you right now then for that situation. And I'm continuing to pray, as you mentioned, for the previous situation that isn't resolved yet. That is huge. Of course, that also means that the pastor needs to keep track of what he's praying for. So he doesn't have to scroll up some big conversation. Oh, yeah, that's right. There was this other thing I'm supposed to still be praying for you. So he needs to keep track at some level what he's praying for so that he knows what to talk about and what is the latest things. And sure, it's all there. But before he makes that first text, he should just review his text a little bit and know what the latest thing is. I mean, especially if he has a big church. (laughs) So if the pastor starts every morning dedicating, let's say, 90 minutes to digital visitations. Mm Mm-hmm. And he can probably go through 10 to 15 digital visits that way Mm -hmm. because he could have multiple conversations at the same time. Oh, yeah, sure. You never know when the other person will write because this is asynchronous computer-mediated communication. That's Mm -hmm. the official term. It's asynchronous because it doesn't have to happen at the same time, and it's computer-mediated. So there, there, there's technology in between the people, but it's still people talking. It's not virtual. Mm -hmm. It's real Mm -hmm. people. So, okay, then the pastor responds. They have that conversation, and the pastor says, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, let me know if anything changes. Mm-hmm. If a pastor does that, let's say you have 500 people in your district, 500 members in your dist- district, um, you can have an interaction with every member every quarter. Mm-hmm. This would be impossible with face-to-face visits. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Perhaps the face-to-face visits should prioritize people that are uh, going through specific crisis right, right. now, which right. is about 20% of the congregation is often going through some kind of crisis. Or who are elderly enough they're not connected digitally for some reason. Yeah, or that. Although, although, Although th- it is really shocking. At my church, there are some people in their 80s that are some of the most, most <laughs> insane. I mean, they're always posting to Facebook something, you know, so. It, usually they have grandchildren who want to be in touch with them. And, and so they are, know how to do basic texting. Yeah, yeah they, they know at how least. To, to connect. Um, the pandemic has accelerated most of these. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about the dimension of members offering pastoral care. So far mm-hmm. we talked about the pastor. Mm-hmm. But we can all pray for each other. We can all offer biblical passages of encouragement. Every church member has mm-hmm. the potential to care for others. Mm-hmm. We care for our families, ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we mm-hmm. care for our children. Mm-hmm. We care for our parents. We care for our siblings. It, it's, you know, at least we should. <laughs> How can a lay person offer online pastoral care? Is there a lot of training that is needed? Um can they just contact people in their congregation and offer prayer? Do you have any concerns about that? Do you want to encourage them or not? Tell me more about that. Of course, they can always contact anybody that they're friends with and say, you know, who can, you know, how can I pray for you? That's meaningful. You know, that that means a lot. But having some training is is helpful. For instance, you know, how much conversation, how much intensive interaction do you have if you are an adult male member and with a teenage girl of the other congregation, for instance, you know, it's like how much interactions do you do that are appropriate that don't um, convey something that you had no intention to convey. Right. Great point. Mm-hmm. And so there's that concern. Also, you know, some, some, some cross-cultural training, especially if their church is multicultural, some churches are not, but many are, you know, things that can be done or not done, which will potentially help to grow the friendship or make the person feel uh, uncomfortable, perhaps put on the spot when that was not your intention at all, but because your culture is different, it felt that way to them. Um, So this will apply to congregations that have multiple ethnicities within the same congregation. Yes, multiple ethnicities and from, and even of the same you know, people can look the same, but be vastly different because sure. of where culture. they're from, uh, right? Because of the culture. Word. That's right. And um, so, so that kind of training is important. Also, knowing what rabbit holes to not go down. 
Some things don't have to be answered just because it was asked it does not mean that you have to go into a five-week Bible study on that particular topic, right? Right, right? Some things need to be handed over to the pastor, and knowing when it is appropriate to let the pastor know, look, there is a there is a major issue going on here. There's a major theological concern that I don't feel equipped to handle. I don't under, you know, I, I I haven't delved this deeply into prophecy, for instance, and they have some real concerns and they want to know more about this and the pastor can handle that. Or situations where maybe it gets more into a counseling type mode. You're not a counselor. You're just a church member. You know, you don't have your degree in counseling as per se. And when to know when to, when to highly suggest to that person that they do need counseling. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's marital infidelity issues, addictions and stuff that that even the pastor may not be the best expert on and need to refer them to somebody for counseling. So some training is really helpful. But that caring element of reaching out to people you already know and praying for them, that that is priceless. When can we expect resources that you will create to help pastors and elders and even some members to provide online pastoral care? (laughs) Well, I am brand new in communications, as you know, but we are definitely working on it where we will have a once a week training on on issues of how to do pastoral visits, um, theology issues sometimes too, because such questions get asked, uh, you know, what to do with doubts, how to help uh, people who who have doubts, it is okay to verbalize the doubts. In fact, it's healthy that they feel comfortable enough with you that they can tell you that mm-hmm. they have this doubt and that they are uncomfortable. And, you know, how to react to that? Do we need to be defensive? Do we need to help them find the answer? Do we guide them? You know, it's like, how, what do we do so in you these said kinds of situations? We'll have weekly meetings. Weekly meetings. And then we're going to be creating some, probably some recordings and some download PDF documents of some guidelines and some resources that are available so that you don't feel like you're in over your head. Excellent. As soon as you can put them out, that will be great. We'll add your email to this uh, description. And if people are interested, they can contact you directly and you can give them more details. Um, let's talk about the opportunity of online pastoral care in the context of evangelism. Mm -hmm. We've been training, we've been working with ads, Facebook and Instagram Mm -hmm. ads Mm -hmm. that offer prayer in a certain region. Mm -hmm. We build a relationship of caring and prayer with others. And then we invite them to, to explore this deeper, more deeply, or to come to the church so we can pray for them in person, which mm-hmm. will create local church uh, relationships, friendships, uh, connection. It's the local church offering online pastoral care to their community, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And eventually pastoral care where they join that local church. Mm-hmm. We've been very successful at it in some prototypes, others not so much. Mm-hmm. How do you think this could be a viable way of entering people's lives beyond trying to knock on their door because less and less people are opening their door these oh, days. Yes. So tell me more about that. Well, I think prayer is probably the easiest way offering prayer, you know, like how can we pray for you? So an ad that says, How can I pray for you? That is huge. I mean, there have been there have been situations one on one where I've just happened to have seen somebody who just looks beyond distraught. Maybe I'm in a grocery store or something and they're silently pushing their cart through the store and tears are coming down their face. You know, they're at the end of their rope. And I've stopped and talked to them and said, you know, what, is there anything I can do? You know, are you OK? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a Christian. Can I can I pray for you? You know, it looks like you're having a rough day. People are shocked because they're not used to anybody having that kind of care. When they can contact you anonymously, you can't see them, you know who they are because you know the name that came in, but you may not have any idea who this person is, where they live, any detail of their life. They feel, like you said earlier, just instantly safe 
and they can just tell you. So, you know, if I was going through some very rough time in my life and I had never met you, I'm not likely to go up to you and say, hey, can you pray for me? I have this issue. But if I see an ad that I can just click on and I can say, yeah, can you just please pray? My marriage is falling apart. You know, my kid is addicted. Um, uh, my mortgage, you know, I cannot meet my mortgage. I just lost my job. Whatever the case is, uh, that is an opportunity to e immediately have an in. And it is an opportunity to be able to answer that prayer request if some church member is providing that care and they're up at 10 o'clock at night and this thing comes in at 10 o'clock at night. For somebody to answer immediately is just shocking. And with the online stuff that I've done, people expect you to be a bot. They expect a bot response. And when they get a face to, you know, not a face to face, but a, a, a real, a human, they're in shock. They're like, really? So you care? Um, we did uh, an evangelistic uh, event online recently where, during the pandemic, where we just did ads for prayer. You know, if you have any prayer requests or Bible questions, contact us here. And we had the instant chat module where they could in instantly talk to somebody, not just send a message and then when you get it. And that first night, two suicides were averted. I mean, person completely at the end of their rope. I know you're not a real person. I know you're not there, but God, I can't take this anymore. Wow. And the person immediately started texting back and says, no, I'm a real person. I'm what right can here. I do? I'm right here. And and, and they, they, they just they just bawled. They're like, I, nobody cares about me. I'm alone in this world. You know, and, my, and my life just fell apart. And we all sometimes feel like that. Uh -huh. Yes. Even when life really isn't that disastrous, you just the weight of whatever happened to you just now seems to erase all the positives in your life at the moment. You know, yeah, and to have a group of people on the other end. Who care? Who care m means a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, we've created an app called Adventist Teams mm -hmm. where people can pray for others. Mm -hmm. They can read the prayer request. They can press the record button. They pray for the other person. They read an encouragement passage, encouraging passage of scripture, and then the other person receives that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, How can we encourage more people to become prayer warriors and to enter someone else's problems to the point that they are interceding with God for God to help this other person that they've never met before? Mm -hmm. We have so many things that we are concerned about our own lives. Mm -hmm. hmm. Why should we focus on someone else's? Because when you focus on somebody else's, your problems become less. How is that possible? <laughs> because you are invested in somebody else's life and you feel like even though I'm going through these things at the moment, the fact is I am able to make a difference in this person's life and it is just the most incredible feeling in the world. And the way to get more people involved is when you hear somebody at your church saying, hey, you know, I decided to try this. And this is some of the experiences that I've had. And they don't share names, but they share the kinds of things that are going on. There is no greater high than knowing that God connected you with somebody. And you pray, you know, let the people that I get connected with be the people that I can minister to the most. And I have seen that with the young people, the teams of young people that we've had that have worked with this over and over and over again in the most bizarre ways. You know, like maybe that young person was an engineer major before. And this person has lots and lots of questions and they are an engineer. Well, they think alike. They have to have every single T crossed and every I dotted and they need to understand all the nitty gritty details. You give that to somebody else that's maybe a music major, they're gonna want to know what the overall scheme of the whole thing, you know? And so God, connects people that have had similar experiences that understand each other. And that is the most empowering, most incredible feeling in the world. And then to know that God has used you to make a difference. Yeah, your problems are still there, but it gives you increased faith too, because you have seen God work through you in behalf of this person. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm telling this person that there isn't anything God can't do. I'm telling this person that they can trust him. 
uh, maybe I should too. <laughs> maybe with this situation, I really need to hand it over to God and quit trying to fix it myself because I'm just making a mess out of it. But God can make a difference. That's that's a great point. I, I just thought of the other element, which is it puts your problems into perspective. Absolutely. You know, you're, you're uh, <laughs> profoundly dissatisfied with life because what you ordered on Amazon <laughs> hasn't arrived yet. In time for Christmas. <laughs> and suddenly you're, you're dealing with somebody who is losing their daughter. Right. You know, and, and that just, and you are feeling, because being a prayer warrior, that's what it is. You, mm. you, you enter the other person's suffering mm -hmm. willingly. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very much an incarnational model, you know, mm -hmm. of, of what Jesus did. You enter the pain and suffering of someone else. You mm -hmm. feel what they feel. You experience it as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And you intercede with God for them. Mm -hmm. When you begin to do that, um, you realize that most of the things that you are anxious and worried and so on are... So minor. Are minor. <laughs> by comparison um, to a lot of people's problems. Right. Yes. So just by opening your eyes mm -hmm. and, you know, there is an expression in Portuguese um, when you when you move your eyes uh, beyond your belly button. You know, it's an expression. <laughs> Some people just keep looking at their belly button all their life. No, when you focus on other people's problems, God takes care of yours. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. talk about um, the CDE. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest innovations in digital evangelism has been brought by Adventist World Radio. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this chief among them. Mm -hmm. The Center for Digital Evangelism is a is a is a center in the Philippines that has v volunteers and missionaries from all over the world that give six months a year of their lives to caring for people online, mm -hmm. and you've helped to to build it from the ground up. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like, and how amazing is this? CD, AWR360 Center for Digital Evangelism in the Philippines. Being able to be there for a world that is hurting. Being able to be a young person because they're between the ages of 18 and 35. They're single. They're from around the world, from different cultures. They are living in a culture not their own in most cases, although we do have some Filipinos because this is in the Philippines but living in a culture that's not their own, working with people from all over the world, so it's like a miniature UN, and then ministering to any and all cultures um, has been just absolutely incredible. Being able to build in resources that they can have on gobs of Bible topics, um, Bible promises, answers to difficult Bible questions, um, some some templates that they can use even, but they can personalize and do things with so they can even respond quicker or to give themselves some ideas um, has been just an incredible experience. Those young people have come knowing that they love God, being solid Adventist, but they leave absolutely knowing what they believe even more than when they came because they're dealing with it 24-7. They're transformed by it. The they're experience. transformed by it. They become absolutely immersed and marinated in the Word of God because that's what they're doing all day long. Their heart is broken uh, for the pain of the world. They get a small glimpse into what God must feel like when he looks down at the pain that we're going through and knowing that heaven is coming and that there is so much hope. So their heart is broken, but it is an incredible thing to be able to offer hope to people that this isn't where it ends, that there is so much more. And that there are people who care and that are willing to mentor them and walk along beside them. So they are messaging them on social media. People contact them from every social media channel you can possibly imagine that exists out there because they've seen it ad, because they've watched evangelism online that drove them to that particular website, um, because their friends have told them about it. Um, they have Zoom Bible studies that they invite people to who come and they talk about you know, yes, the 28 fundamental beliefs, but also how to how to walk with Jesus, how to have a prayer life, how to develop a devotional life. It's hard to be dry yourself because 
in order to give, you have to be immersed yourself. And so these young people will tell you that their own personal walk with God has been just totally revitalized and everything else because they are spending time every day grabbing the truths of God's word in order to share them and preparing them to to give it. And it's and it's an excellent experience for them because the people that come to that particular Bible study may be from 10 different countries. Their backgrounds are so different. You know, the advantage of the church member working with the area around their church is they know their people pretty much. But these are working with people from around the world. And there's a huge difference in the level of knowledge and understanding and uh, of not just the Bible, but just God in general. What would you say to a young person that's listening to this and is feeling the call to adventure, uh, the call to, to go to the city and to give a year of their lives helping thousands of others to know how much God loves them? They will never regret it, first of all. You know, there are things you do that you say afterwards, eh, I could have lived a long time without doing that. That was probably a little bit of a waste of time. This, no way. They they leave there saying, this is the best thing that ever, ever happened to me. This has marked me for life. So if they go to awr.org forward slash missionary, they can see the calls there and they can apply. We not only just need people to minister to people, but we also look for skills other skills like people who have programming skills or <clears throat> excuse me or graphic arts and design uh, that can help us with the advertisements people who like to write scripts people who like to do editing just all kinds of you know who, people who like to do videography whatever just all kinds of skills but everybody no matter where their skill sets are are ministering daily as well online even if this other thing like computer programming or something is a part of their job because you can't create resources when you are not doing the work because you have no idea what the needs are. But now that you're doing the work, you know what you need so now you can create it. Fantastic. Um, let's go back to pastors now. Mm -hmm. We are preparing a resource to be used by local conference and local union ministerial mm -hmm. Uh, directors, ministerial secretaries, to train their pastors to conduct online pastoral care. Mm -hmm. And it will be about 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And we want to help pastors, even in that short space of time, to learn the basic skills of how to do what they do really well face-to-face, -face, how to do that effectively um, online through mm -hmm. some instant messaging platform mainly. What are your hopes from those workshops? I am hoping that pastors will take away from that a deep desire to connect in ways that they've never connected before, that it will open their eyes to the possibilities that they can connect. You know, so many times we say, oh, yes, sister, I'll pray for you. And as we're driving into the parking lot, we see her walking into the church and we're like, oh, yes, Lord, because I don't want to lie. Please be with sister so-and-so. And then you go in, right? But that's not interceding right? Mm -hmm. These days, oh, I've been praying for you, mm -hmm. right? When you drove into the parking lot, right? So it's the how to be invested in, in a way, you know, some people think that social media makes you live a more cluttered, a busier life. But when it comes to in ministry, to a certain extent, it slows you down. And that is a good thing because it makes you take the time to actually, what am I praying for? Why am I praying for this person? And what are their needs? What are their struggles that they're going through? What they learn from this ministry that they're doing to their church members in the community will drive their sermon series. It will help them to know how to scratch where it itches. So many times we give information and it may be wonderful information, but if it's not what the hearts and souls of their community and their church needs at the moment. It's just information. And people come and they sit there in church and they listen and they nod and they sing and they go home, but it didn't necessarily sink in. But when you know what the needs of your community are and you know what the needs of your of your church members are, the, the possibility of your effectiveness in how you are dealing and how you are managing your church, not to mention it will probably give you some insights into some of the struggles 
the internal struggles that are in every church between people and why and can give you tools to pray for them instead of just being frustrated that brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so don't like each other. Hmm. And they're always at each other's throats. Now you know the background and you can actually see both sides of the issue and you can have compassion for both sides and say, you know what? There's pain here mm. on both sides. And where there is smoke, there's a fire and we need to deal with the fire. Excellent. You've just come back from the Philippines training yes. our 11 Uh, independent contractors there who, mm -hmm. who help us with online pastoral care. Mm -hmm. um, how was that experience? It was so incredible to see people whose hearts are sold out to make a difference, whose hearts are, are just beating in tune, I would say, to a great extent with God's heart, you know? Um, yeah, that was a beautiful thing. They're of all different ages. We've got some that are probably 23, 24. We've got some that are 60, 65 um, from different walks of life. Some of them have had pastoral training. Um, one of them is a stay-at-home mom, you know. Uh, one of them is a university professor uh, or works in a university. You know, so the variety is amazing because I think God pairs them up with people that need to have their experience there. Um, It was also a really incredible experience because as we went through the different modules of training, including cross-cultural training, um, I was able to see some lights go on because they deal with the world. And they're like, oh, is that why so-and-so had this reaction when I said this? I couldn't figure out why they had that reaction, you know, whether positive or negative. And uh, so I think that the cross-cultural training element was helpful And it was just exciting because I believe that they're just a drop in the bucket, but they're an important drop in the bucket. They are the beginning of Niagara Falls. And that first little drop to go over the edge is going to be followed by the next drop and pretty soon it will be unstoppable. And that's what we're after. That's an interesting analogy. Hmm. <laughs> okay, if you could talk to pastors, you're gonna look in this camera here and you're gonna talk to our pastors. What would you tell them uh, in encouraging them to to join the new medium of online to extend their pastoral care? And then at the end of your words to them, if you could pray for them uh, and for us as we move forward with this. Mm -hmm. So pastors, you have the most incredible job in the universe. I hope you know that, right? You have the opportunity to affect lives for eternity. You have, as Pastor Sam said, the opportunity to be there for people in their most joyous moments and in their most heartbreaking moments as well. And uh, through digital ministry, it is not meant in any way to replace the face-to-face -face ministry that you have, but it is meant to augment and to give you Uh, a deeper connection and an instant connection that doesn't have to wait a week or between prayer meetings or between Sabbath morning services. It is a way to connect immediately with those, with those in your community. Also through Avenus Teams, your churches and your church members can be sharing on their social media channels all kinds of helpful and intriguing information on a huge variety of topics, whatever is of interest to their friends and family, whatever is of interest to them. And that itself will not only make their social media channels more evangelistic, but it will also help them to connect in a new way with their friends and family that they didn't do before by just uh, maybe sharing their latest vacation pictures or the latest thing that they ate for lunch at this amazing restaurant somewhere, right? And so it gives them an opportunity to share as well. It will give you as a pastor an opportunity to mentor your church members on how to do digital evangelism and digital friendship and to help them help their families, members, and their friends to start developing a walk with Jesus. You know, I think so many times we hear mission stories from other countries around the world where amazing conversions take place. And we say, wow, that is so cool. But maybe that kind of thing doesn't happen as often in the Western world. Um, I think it can. 
first of all. I think it has. I think that often we miss out on those incredible stories because we were not connected one-on-one -on -one with them, walking through the process with them and seeing what God has done. Whatever God does when he changes a life, that is a miracle of epic proportions, regardless of whether this person was just a Christian who has lost his connection with God or somebody who has never considered walking with God before. So the chances that this will revitalize your church, will excite them for getting into ministry, will make a difference in your connection with your church members, will help you get to know the community of people around your church and in your area is huge. And there are some ideas that we will be sharing with you in the near future that I am very excited about of things that you can do at your church with the people that are responding to the ads around your church to start connecting them to your church long before you ever have an evangelistic series. So that as a canvasser, a previous canvasser, I canvassed several summers to get through school, would tell you that gives you the warm market to go after. Instead of just mailing out invitations and spending thousands and thousands of dollars, which is important, but it lands there and you know the percentage is very, very small of those that will come. But when you are connected to them already and have been for a number of months before you have any kind of a reaping event, that makes an enormous difference. So I am excited that these resources will be available for you shortly, that we will have, yes, the 90 minute training, but we will also be able to continually give you resources, give you ideas, tell you about other churches that are experiencing um, success in this area and what kinds of things they are doing that you can try at your church as well. Because of course, every culture is different. Every, every area of the United States is different. But uh, my prayer for you is this, and that is that uh, something that Paul says here in Colossians, he was asking for prayer to reach people in the community. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying for us that God would open the door, would open to us a door for the word to speak the min ministry of Christ for which I am also in chains. See, Paul was not limited by the fact that he was in chains. He had an audience in the jail. He had an audience through his pen. You know, if he had had social media, Paul would have been so excited, right? But even though I'm in chains, please pray that God will open the door for us, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Some of you are convinced that your territory is impossible and that your area is the hardest area to win souls for Christ. Well, that may be true. But it says here, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. We live too late in earth's history to be playing church, right? We need to be getting involved with people around us. And let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And I love this phrase here, seasoned with salt, because, you know, salt gives flavor to food. And when food has flavor, you know, we may actually be uh, <laughs> tempted to eat more than what we need, but at least it is palatable. It is tasteful. And you know what the other thing is with salt? Salt, if you have enough of it, makes you thirsty. We are to make people around us, not just in our churches, but people around us thirsty for the gospel where they realize that something is missing and God will give us the words. God will give us grace so that we know how we ought to answer everyone as we have the promise that when we're brought before kings and, and 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 priests and queens that we shouldn't worry about what we're going to say because the holy spirit in that moment will give us what we should say and so digital ministry may be new to you it may be different to you but god is going to tell you how to make it work for your church for your community and uh, we're going to be there every step of the way to give you as many resources and help as possible so that you too can find a door open in your community where you can reach people for Christ and that your churches will be revitalized, that they will not be coming there, just a few being involved in ministry, but that a much larger percentage, maybe your entire church, can be involved in witnessing for Christ and making a difference with their friends and family and those 
in your community. Let me just pray for you at this time. Dear Father in heaven, you know every pastor, every church member that is watching this or is listening to this podcast, Lord. You know the deep desires of their heart. You know how they want nothing more than to reach their communities, to reach that relative, that family member, that 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 coworker, that friend with the gospel of salvation because they can't imagine heaven without that person there. Lord, revitalize our churches. Give us an excitement, a passion to reach the world for you. Be with each pastor here that is listening, that is within uh, the sound of my voice here, that you would give them courage, knowing that even if the territory around their church is one of the most difficult territories where they have ever ministered before, and where maybe there hasn't been a baptism except for maybe a child of a church member in the last 10 years, I've been in churches like that, I have visited them before, that that does not mean the past does not define the present nor the future, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to be able to develop and to be able to to have ways of connecting with people, ways that we maybe haven't done so much before. Give us the expertise. Give us the grace. Give us the, the words to speak so that we will know when to say something and when to maintain silence. What questions to ask, how to pray for people. And Lord, most of all, give us faith that you are the God that can do abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, and that you will give us the words to speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karen. There are 21,376 ordained and commissioned pastors Wow. uh, around the world. That is exciting, and you're one of them. That is so awesome. (laughs) Can't wait to meet you one of these days. If you have a pastor, send them this video so that he can be, they can be aware of this episode. If you're listening to this on a podcast, audio only, also send them the link to this podcast. I hope that this was helpful to you. And we thank you for every minute that you spend with us. It is very meaningful to us. Uh, subscribe to this channel or subscribe to this podcast. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>